So, uh, yeah, uh, so my talk is going to be about how we are using Kubernetes in our project. Uh, this isn't going to be a very technical talk because a lot of people don't know what Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is, and it's a pretty new thing, uh, though it has been there for quite some years, and Google has been using that in their projects. Uh, so right now, I'm, what this talk is basically going to cover is why you should use Kubernetes for a project of yours. If you have a very big project and you would like that to uh, handle a lot of load, or if you have different kinds of different parts of the project which you need to be running together, then I would suggest you should use Kubernetes. Uh, so it may seem like I'm advertising for Kubernetes, but yeah, so let's, so when I say about open event, I'm not just talking about the open event server. Open event, the open event ecosystem consists of a lot of things. So right now these are the major things uh, which the open event project consists of. We have the Android app generator, then we have the web app generator and we have scrapers. And along with that, we have a companion organizer app which the organizers can use. So let's go one by one to see what, what each of these things uh, consists of, yeah? So let's start with the Android app generator. So the Android app generator has all these components. So we have a Flask web framework which provides the web interface for using the generator, which uh, Mario showed a preview of some time back. Uh, and then we have we use the Android SDK to build the actual final APK. And then uh, we have a Celery job queue because uh, when a lot of people want to build multiple Android applications, we don't want all that happening at the same time and crashing the server, right? Because compiling an Android application is going to take up a lot of processing power. Yeah, and uh, once we start getting a lot of load, we may want to run parallel uh, queues to process multiple Android application jobs parallelly in different servers. So we have a celebrity job queue for that. And the communication between the web framework and the job queue is uh, kind of handled by Redis. Redis acts as the data bridge in between both of them. So this is what the Android app generator consists of. And then uh, next we'll move on to the next part of it, which is the web app generator. Web app generator is, the setup is pretty simple. We have Node.js and Express.js as a web framework, which will be handling, handling everything. Next we have open event scrapers. So open event scrapers are used to get data from other event websites. Like for example, you have an event, you have an event on Eventbrite. For it, let's say, and you want to move to the open event project or event TA. So instead of manually you having to get all the data from event write and typing it into open event, you can use the open event scraper which can automatically scrape the event write website page of your event and then uh, put it in a format which you can quickly import into the open event server project. So that right now we support only event write and it uses Python, but in future we may have other modules which use which is for different services. So that is what the foo and bar blocks are for, because for future development. So these three are the main components. Organizer app, the only component about it, there's no server component for the organizer app, which because it's going to use the open event server API. Now this is the main part of the project. This is the server and API in which all the other projects, other uh, app generators depend on. So for the open event server, we have four main components right now, which is the Flask web framework again. And then we also have a Celery job queue, which handles import jobs, export jobs, and also sending emails for now. Then we have PostgreSQL and Redis. And in the future, or at least for this GSOP 2017, we have a plan of implementing Elasticsearch and Kibana for uh, large scale data searching and analytics. So if we have that, we are gonna have those boxes also for, for the part of this project. So as you can see, the whole open event ecosystem has, is now very big. Yeah, initially we started with these these four things, and then each of these things had a lot of other components. And uh, so, uh, like for example, Sapta gave us the de deployment process of open event server alone. And as you can see, the whole process was very long. And imagine a similar process for each of these things. And let's say you want to import, uh, you want to deploy this whole ecosystem somewhere. Uh, so the job at hand is going to be very hectic if you want to sit and uh, you know run each of the commands for, for each of the deployments manually and like Saptak said the uh, deployment process may vary depending on which operating system you're going to be using which distro so to prevent so we need a way of you know unifying the deployment process across different platforms yeah so for that let me start with a small example a uh, real world example unrelated to programming 
uh, let's say you have a lot of products with, in your hand. Let's say you have a car, you have a bike and everything. You want to transfer that car and bike from one country to the other. Okay, so let's say you want to go, you want to uh, ship, ship the products. So uh, bike is of a different size, the car is of a different size. So let's say you just take your car to the shipping port and then now uh, the shipping port will have a crane to lift things, right? Now if that crane tries to lift your car, it will not be able to lift the car because the crane is not made for your car. And let's say they make a car for your, they make a crane for your car. And then if that crane you're using to lift the bike, it will not be able to do it. Correct? It's a very simple example. So what do you do? You put everything inside containers. Yeah, an equal uniform containers. So you put a car in the blue container, you put the bike in the red container. Now any crane in any part of the world will be able to lift this container. Correct? And not just cranes, like if you, uh, now you're shipping to another country and then you're putting it on a truck. Any truck can carry this container, irrespective of what is inside. Yeah? The truck or the crane or the ship uh, need not know what is inside. For the ship, all this is is the uniform container. Yeah, it can easily carry. In the same way for programming uh, or applications, computer applications, we have something called as containerization. So what containers are in computer terminology is, it's an isolated, uh, let's say an isolated process space where you can run your applications, run your applications or servers or whatever in a very uniform way. That is, uh, so what containers are is, they are an isolated process, I, containers have an isolated process space and a network interface. That is, to anything that is running inside a container, let's say you're running a flash, ser flash server inside a container. That flash server is going to think that it's running inside a whole new computer on its own. Yeah, the, con the flash web server is not going to know on what, uh, host system it's running in. A container can run on Mac and Linux, but and it the results will be the same. So for deploying, all you have to do is just say, I want to deploy this container and it'll get deployed. None of the installation process will be there. And it and uh, the programs inside the container will have full root access also. And you can't give any more excuses like, it works on my system, but I don't know why it's not working on your system. Because when it comes to containers, if that container works on your system, that same container will work in the same way on someone else's system also, as long as it's Linux or Mac, for example. So that is what is containers. Now, containers is just a box which is uh, having one component in it. So now we need, uh, now when it comes to a big project like Open Event, we are going to have multiple containers, right? The PostgreSQL database is going to be sitting inside one container, let's say the Flask web server is going to be sitting in one container. Now we need a way to manage all of this. So that's where this guy comes in. Yeah, the cute way now. So what this guy does is, this guy is gonna help us manage all these containers. So this guy is kind of like the ship. You, you can get it from the logo. You're gonna put all the containers on this guy and this guy is gonna manage the containers for us. This guy is gonna take the containers wherever we want. Let's say you, this, you want these containers deployed on AWS or Google Compute Engine, this guy is gonna help us do that in a very simple way. So that is what Docker is. So in general, Docker is a software container management platform. So that is the proper term of whatever I said just now. And it's open source, so that's good for us. Come on, we are false. Then uh, you can run any application, any language inside inside a Docker container, so I can run I can run my open event server project, Harshit can run this Android app generator, and Ayush can run this web app generator. So it's not going to be an issue. And it has built-in container orchestration. So orchestration is generally managing a lot of things together. You know, you have an orchestra, you have a lot of people singing. So a lot of people singing together in a very uh, organized manner. So that's an orchestra. So same way here, container orchestration, it will be able to organize all your containers in a very manner that you define define like how you want them to be organized. Then it's again, the same what I told some time back, build once, run anywhere. You just have to build a container once and you can run anywhere from the image. Now, this is just one ship, right? Yeah, so I have one Docker, one ship like this. Let's consider this a ship. One ship like this for my open event server project, one ship like this for the Android project, and one ship like this for the web app project. Now we want all of these to work together. So for every ship needs a captain, right? So that is where our, this guy comes in. This is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the captain for this ship. 
okay kubernetes is going to kubernetes uses docker and kubernetes is going to tell docker how it's supposed to do things and where in a very awesome manner and which i'll be showing you now so the name kubernetes uh, in greek actually means captain master governor pilot yeah so the name exactly says what it does so kubernetes is an open source project by google which was built by google for their own purposes so most of google servers right now use kubernetes for deployment and you all know how reliable google servers are we test our internet connection with google servers yeah we just open google.com to see if our internet works so so this is the definition directly of the kubernetes.io website kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment scaling and management of containerized applications so let's see what each thing like how each thing works so kubernetes has horizontal scaling so there are two types of scaling in general which is vertical and horizontal so vertical scaling generally means increasing all of your resources like increasing your ram hard disk and everything horizontal scaling is increasing the number of machines you can either have one machine with a lot of ram or multiple machines with, with with a nominal amount of ram so kubernetes just horizontal scaling it does not increase the resources instead it increases the number of instances then this is the part of kubernetes which i love the most which is self healing uh, let's say you have a deployment version 1 running and now you are pushing version 2 deployment and for some reason your version 2 deployment has an error So what Kubernetes does is it switches back to the version one deployment which does not have an error if it notices that the version two deployment has an error. So in Kubernetes, uh, let's say the version one is deployed to the public, the customers are using your website. So when you say Kubernetes, you want to deploy version two. What Kubernetes does is instead of quickly switching the version one to version two for the public, it first starts the version two, deploys the version two in a sandbox state, and then it you can define certain health checks on. on your deployments so what kubernetes does is it runs the health checks on those deployments and first checks if that deployment works and only if it works it switches the deployment to version 2 for the for the public until then it keeps it inside so uh, the users will not have any users will not be facing any errors due to messed up deployments because if the deployment is messed up the user is never going to see it it all happens internally automatic roll that's what is automatic rollouts and rollbacks like you tell it to put an update and if it doesn't work it will roll back on its own you don't have to tell it and then there is load balancing so you have multiple instances of the database server running uh kubernetes will automatically adjust which database instance to use depending on how much load is uh, on each of the instance then storage orchestrations nowadays we have a lot of storage options we can either use the local uh, drive of that machine or you may want to use uh, s3 from Amazon or Azure or the Azure cloud storage servers, or you may want to set up your own NFS uh, storage server. So Kubernetes support all that. Then batch executions. Now I showed you the whole open event ecosystem, right? For the open event organizer server, we have a set of uh, configuration files in different folders for Kubernetes. All I have to do is tell Kubernetes to recursively deploy everything in that folder. It will just quickly go inside that folder, see everything, and then deploy. In uh, in in a matter of few minutes, I can have the whole open event setup running on a server. Then predictable deployment. Uh, this is the same thing which I told you in containers. If it's going to work on one machine, it's going to work on that. So, if you if the Kubernetes deployment works on Google Container Engine, it's going to work on the Amazon Elastic Container Cloud also. Then optimized resource allocation. Uh, so this is another cool thing about Kubernetes. Uh, you can specify how when you want multiple instances of certain things to run so if you you can tell kubernetes that in case the uh, system load on the web server goes beyond 50% create another instance for the web server so every time the load for the web server goes above 50% kubernetes will automatically create another instance for the web server and then now they will have two instances running so now we are using additional resources and the once the load goes again back below the threshold it will remove that extra instance so now we will not be using that extra resource unnecessarily this is just one example so kubernetes does a lot of things like this now uh let's see what a kubernetes cluster is yeah this is a bit right now it's going getting a little bit technical so each of these things kubelets each of these kubelets can be a physical machine yeah each, let's consider each of these kubelets to be physical machines so you are giving control of these three physical machines to kubernetes to the master 
master is going to control these three cubelets. So the master is free to create containers wherever it wants across these three cubelets. Now inside each cubelet in Kubernetes, we have something called as a pod. A pod can con should contain at least one container in minimum and it can contain n number of volumes. So a pod can contain two containers connected to one volume or one container to two volume. A volume is generally a storage space. It could be an NFS server or it could be local space or it could be a ghost ghostfs cluster. That's your wish. So a pod is the uh, minimum computational unit in Kubernetes. You can't go below a pod. pod. You always need a pod and pod inside the pod there will be a container. So uh, for the open event project we have a pod for the web, web server, we have a pod for the Postgres server like that and then we have something called as a replication container co controller so what replication controller is uh, you'll tell replication controller how a pod should look like you'll give a template for the replication controller and you'll tell how many instances of this pod should be created on what conditions so what replication controller does is depending on your conditions it will create n number of pods so this is what I told you some time back about the load in replication controller you will specify that for this low threshold, I need so many pods. For this this uh, low threshold, I need so many pods. So depending on how much load your threshold you're giving, it's going to create that many number of pods. So let's say all of a sudden your site is getting a lot of users. Yeah. So that is what even like uh, even uh, some a site like event A can get a lot of users during that event day, and then the next day the user count is going to go down. That's how it varies, right? There'll be peaks whenever an event is happening because all will be like checking schedules and everything. So during those days, you can't have a big DevOps team sitting and seeing which event is going to peak now and create extra servers, right? Which is really not economical and efficient. So that is where uh, Kubernetes and replication controllers come in. Replication controller will do that for you. Like as an asset sees a load peak, it's, it'll create pods for you and separate uh, and plot pods for you and balance the load across the pods. So how does the balancing work? Uh, so let's say we have the PostgreSQL pod. Yeah, PostgreSQL, let's say there are three instances of the database pod. And your web servers will not know that there are three instances. Yeah, your web server is just going to want to access the database. Your web server does not care how many instances of database you have. All the web server wants is access to your database. So irrespective of the number of pods, you have one service attached to the pod. That service is going to do the load balancing for you. You see an IP address written on top of there, right? It's just an example IP address on the port. The web server is just going to access that IP address for the database. And then depending on which pod has the less load, the servers will connect the web server to either one of these things. The web server only has to access the IP address. The web server need not worry about which of these instances to access. Yeah, so that way the servers will uh, give you the one with the le least amount of load. So whatever I've told you just now is just a fraction of what Kubernetes is capable of. Uh, I'm still learning about Kubernetes and I started using it only a few months back for event year as a part of my last year's GSOC project. So this is our complete open event ecosystem. Okay, whatever graphs I showed, like whatever flowcharts I showed you before, I put it all in the same page. So imagine doing all the deployment process manually for this whole setup. Yeah. So uh, for the open event server alone, the uh, process explaining the deployment took took 30 minutes, right? Just explaining it. Imagine doing it on a system for this whole ecosystem. It's going to be very hectic, right? Hectic and probably not not practical and possible even because something that works here may not work on the other. And imagine, and you may not, you may want to run it on different environments. Not everybody wants to use Google Cloud. Someone wants to use Amazon, Amazon uh, AWS. And someone, if they are very concerned about security or someone is very paranoid, they may want to run it on their own servers. They may have a whole bunch of servers sitting on their room and then they want to run it there. And the steps are gonna vary for each of these things. So you can see the number of combinations you have. Right? Uh, so that is where something like Kubernetes comes into picture. So Kubernetes can easily ensure that this whole setup can be deployed in a matter of minutes. Uh, deploying open event server alone to Kubernetes takes me around 15 minutes via Kubernetes. And I don't have to do anything. I just have to run a command and it's going to do everything on its own. It just uh, loops through all the directories and then it just deploys it. So it's very easy and awesome to use. and 
I am I kind of love Kubernetes, so that's it. So thank you. Any questions? And if you are interested in the slide, you can download it here. So thank you. Any questions? And happy to answer. Nothing? OK, then. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, you said that uh, Kubernetes can uh, automatically balance the load. Yeah. You? Okay, so I think uh, there are many other services that do, do the same. For example, Azure does the same thing. And uh, there's DistroOcean, AWS, other things that, that do almost the same, similar things. So any reason why you picked up Kubernetes? Just because it's open source? That's what One that reason is it's open source, yes. I mean, compared to those things, like uh, what was the other thing? DistroOcean, Azure, and AWS. Okay, Azure, I don't know. Uh, but AWS, I have uh, used it a bit. So in AWS, most of these things, uh, as you can see, you'll need to tell it for this. Uh, there's no easy way of telling it in AWS. You'll have to manually specify in the project, right? You have to go there, and then you, you can either use the uh, command line interface, or you can use the web interface and tell them, like, for this, you have to increase the load. Like, for, for this part, depending on the load, create multiple things. But in uh, Kubernetes, this is part of your pod configuration itself. So when you're deploying, it's, it's just you just run a command and all of these configurations go along with it. You don't have to, again, go to the Google container, uh, Google Cloud uh, web interface for this, any of this. There's just one step. Deploy and you're done. All of this is part of that step. It's just easier to use. But then it's personal preference. Mostly it's personal preference. Like some people want to use Amazon Container Service, and I prefer this. So if you feel you are comfortable with that, you are always free to use that. Thank you. Thanks. There's no more questions. Uh, uh, question. <coughs> Can you go to your previous page, page What is the yellow part? The boxes. Huh? There, there is a duplicate of class. Uh, that is for the Android app generator. Yeah, Android app generators packages are the yellow ones, and scrapers are the purple ones, and the blue ones are the server. I'm just grouping everything together. How much does it cost to run this um, complex on the Google cloud? Uh, right now, we are running only the open event server and Android app generator on Google. Uh, billing, I'm not sure. Mario would know. <laughs> Uh, he's the billing owner for that project, so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One question. Can we put all these uh, components into one instance, the physical instance, the magic by the one idea? Technically, yes, you can put all of this in one instance if that instance is big enough. Okay. Yeah, because we have RAM constraints, right? RAM constraints. You have a bigger, you need a bigger RAM, then hard disk space is fine, you can manage it. But RAM is a big concern because, especially, some things like the Android app generator is going to require a lot of RAM value. But then the Kubernetes, we are still working, right? Uh, Kubernetes we are using uh, right now, our EventA site is using three three PC, three PCs, three machines. Okay. For those uh, load balancing, all the features were still able to work. Huh? For those uh, load balancing, the features in the Kubernetes were still working in this condition, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again.